what? This is the most fundamental element of a thriving civilization. What are the ties that bind us together in this inexorable march that we seem to have to populate the world? Mega cities. What are those building blocks that allow us to relate to each other in the ways that make places like Memphis special? The original formation of the marketplace was compelling. It allowed for specialization in unique ways. You could hook your cart up to your oxen and take it to the marketplace and specialize in foods, in products, and barter began to take place that allowed us to gather together along unique networks that changed the way the world works. The very pillars of civilization always, always butted up against a roadway. The roadways were the paths that led from city to city, from place to place. The roads began to expand. The Roman roads began to connect continents. Continents began to string together in compelling ways that allowed the Silk Roads to begin to mesh networks together, Asian networks and Western networks. The Spice Roads and the Tea Roads to the subcontinent of India began to link networks together, not always without consequence. The collision of cultures along these roadways sometimes had dire consequences, sometimes led to war. But over time, over time, we've learned to work together, to be together, and to operate in the world more seamlessly. It wasn't just the roadways. It was the routes that coursed the seas, the Peloponnesian shipping lanes, the clipper ships, the inevitable connection of the continents around the world in unique ways that allowed civilization and trade to flourish. We had significant innovations along these constructs, massive investments that led to new ways of thinking, new ways of investing. Why do you think the Monopoly Board has a railroad on each side of it? Why do you think the train stations around the world are so magnificent? It's because it's where all the money was going, all of the investment. This changes everything, people said. Tycoons were born, the wealthiest people in the world. Does that sound familiar? The ways that we connect the world through networks began to change everything. Today, we live in a world so connected, it's amazing. The investments that we make in building out networks that connect the world in our company are extraordinary. We believe in a purpose at our company. We have a stated purpose that goes like this. We connect people and possibilities around the world. And through that, businesses prosper communities flourish, people thrive, and the world becomes a better place. That's our stated purpose statement, and we believe that it's a critical part of how the world works today. Think of an unconnected world. An unconnected world is a world where crops rot in the fields 100 kilometers from the starving village. Connections matter in allowing us to build a civilized society. I remember one time standing on the Grand Canal in Venice. I was going to visit a customer, a guy named Fabrizio Rubelli. Fabrizio Rubelli was the great, 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 great grandson of Antonio Rubelli, who founded Rubelli Fabrics in Venice. They worked and lived in the same place along the Grand Canal that they'd lived for so many years. And Fabrizio was opening drawers and said, this is the fabric from the papal gown for the coronation of Pope Peter in the 15th century, 
or something like that. It was stunning, the continuity of this business across time. And when you stand in Venice, if you've ever stood there, one thing strikes you, how improbable it all is. How does this place rise up out of the sea? And it's not because of what they make in Venice. It's really not about blown glass. Murano glass is not the reason that it existed for centuries as the trading capital of the world. It was actually the networks that met there. The merchant brokers of Venice were uniquely qualified to attach high-value goods to the marketplaces which they could be served. Silks, spices, art, so many things came together and went back out through that network. When we think about Memphis, Tennessee, we have a unique set of connected assets. Did you know that this is the fourth largest inland port in the country? The Mississippi River is the second largest river in the world. Did you know that together we have six class one railroads that meet in Memphis, Tennessee? Only three other cities in North America have six class one rails. 200 trains move through our city. If you drive down Poplar, you know that every six, <laughs> six and a half minutes, you know, the, the lights start to flash and you can't make a right. Um, it's, it's amazing how connected we are as a city. When you look at our roadways, we are the cross section. We are the intersection for the North American continent. It's not just I-40 and I-55. It's the I-69 NAFTA corridor. It's I-22 coming through here. This is the busiest commerce intersection in the country. It divides the country into quadrants. If you drive I-40 or I-55, you know that. But we also have runways. People think about us in terms of runways. Memphis International Airport is, for the last 20 years, either number one or number two in the world as the world's busiest air cargo airport. In fact, I believe we've spent 17 out of the last 20 years being the number one air cargo airport in the world. All of that connection is a powerful tool for us. How did Venice stay so relevant in a world for centuries on end? It's because they connected the world. They connected trade in the world. We live in a trapezoid here in the United States. We're at the bottom corner of a trapezoid that really balances the population in the trade lanes across North America. It's why our company is here. The physical networks aren't the end all and be all. The physical networks were really just the beginning. They're important, but they don't answer all of the questions. As electrical telegraphy was born, we began to connect people in virtual ways. We began to be able to send messages and communication through telegraph, telephone, radio, and television in unique ways that allowed the world's connections to explode. They exploded in a completely different format that have challenged the way that we think about the world. They've challenged so many things about the very fabric, the folkways and mores of a civilized social society. But it's important to note that the combination of the digital networks and the physical networks are extraordinarily powerful. Our company was founded on the very idea, a very famous quote from Fred Smith back in the 1970s that said, the information about the package is just as important as the package itself. The information about the package, what did that mean? That meant that the digital worlds were beginning to mirror the physical worlds, that you could see through digitization where things were physically. You could begin to track things, and inventory began to change from those stacks of things you could go lay hands on and count to not just product at rest, a product at rest and in motion. And as the internet was born, we were able to see and source things around the world in unique ways that opened up marketplaces, opened up possibilities. Those connections that allowed for people and possibilities to thrive around the world.
The internet grew and grew, and, and we have access to so many things today on the basis of what is a connected world, where the number of endpoints on a network exponentially create value. Exponentially created value based on the number of endpoints out there in the world. It's an extraordinary thing, and that physical and digital network are at play in shaping the world's marketplaces. But there's an important departure that began to take place with digital connections, and that's the social connections. We always believed, and many of us still believe today, that there is absolutely no substitution for that shake in the hand and look in the eye. But relationships have begun to change. Relationships have begun to flourish digitally, and let me give you a personal example. I have a teenage daughter, actually she's not a teenager anymore, but I have a daughter who came to me a couple of years ago and said, Dad, can I hang out with Adam? So this is the story of Adam and Teresa. I said, well, Teresa, where do we know Adam from? Church? School? Where, you know, is he here in the neighborhood? No, Dad, we know Adam from Facebook. So as a parent, what? Every red flag in the room. I can see red flags jumping up all over the room. And I said, Teresa, I have an idea. Let's go look at Adam's Facebook page through your Facebook page. So we did. And guess what? Adam had about 400 friends in Memphis, Tennessee. I knew probably 30 or 40 of them. There was nothing particularly onerous about this boy. So he showed up in our lives. I said, sure, Adam can come hang out with us here for a while. And, uh, you know, Adam, you know, the, the, it's kind of an interesting end of the story. Dr. Scott Morris is marrying Teresa two weeks from today. Not to Adam, no, no, Adam, that was, that was 25 boyfriends ago, but, at, but Teresa's, Teresa's getting married. And the point is, is that, you know, this was a pretty accountable way to meet someone. And I thought about when I was in college, and I thought about a specific event that took place then. And I went to school in Florida, and there was this very handsome, very articulate, very charismatic fellow who showed up in the campuses of Florida State and began to work his way into the hearts and lives of women there and brutally murdering them. His name was Ted Bundy. That handshake, that look in the eye, that thing that we put so much value in was a lie. Appearances can be deceiving. There's no question about it. Sometimes digital accountability is actually greater than the accountability that we experience when we look someone in the eye. That's just the way it is. I was standing outside the office of the Google CEO a few years back, and he had this unbelievable spinning globe outside on a huge panel out there, and it was the inquiries that were coming in from around the planet against the Googleplex. Just an extraordinary set of data coming in, and the spires represented the height of, of uh, the number of inquiries that were coming in from parts of the world. The colors of the spires represented the language that those inquiries were coming in to Google. I stepped into the office, and Eric Schmidt at that point in time, the CEO, said, let me show you something really cool. And he showed me a chat room that was taking place where people were chatting online but the fascinating thing about this chat room is whether you spoke Farsi or Spanish or French or English, it appeared that everybody in the chat room was speaking the same language as you. The technological boundaries are beginning to take away some of those lines that have defined us for so long. The lines on the map that scar the map are fiction. When you step back from this planet and you look at Shelby County, and you look at Tennessee, and you look at the United States of America, you see lines drawn on there. We created those lines so we would have a sense of belonging that allowed us to understand exactly where we connected. What if, what if a world began to emerge where those lines were less important, where we had a sense of belonging, not just through the important physical relationships and the ability to roam, in our neighborhoods, but through the people around this planet that we could connect to. 
But there's a different kind of map out there that we've been looking at lately. This map is the opposite of the Google map that I was talking about. This map represents disconnected populations in the world. This map represents the places where the population is there, but there's no ability to connect to the world outside of that. Those populations represent about 60% of the planet's population. Here in Memphis, Tennessee, we have about 32% of our families that have no access to the internet, either at work or at home. There are initiatives taking place to allow that to happen, but what about in 38108? What about in 38114? What about these places that have no ability to see beyond those lines that define them, to see beyond that very specific place? It's incredible to note that the view that these neighborhoods have is the view that they see on the streets in front of their house and not much bigger. We've heard so many opportunities today to think about belonging to something more significant. What if, in our world, what if those lines went away? What if we belonged to something that was a little more significant, like 901? 901's a virtual set of boundaries. Yes, there's a physical boundary for our area code, but we constantly hear about the opportunities that exist in 901. 901 is transforming. 901 is uplifting. There's no question about that. We connect people and possibilities in this world that allow businesses to thrive, that allow our community to flourish, that allow people to prosper. But what if those places aren't connected? What if those businesses fail and that community, la community languishes and people struggle? The answer to that is, in fact, the connections. The ties that bind us together are connections. The most fundamental aspect of civil society are the connections, physical, digital, and social connections that define how we relate to each other in such a critical way. Let's make sure, as a community, that we connect the people and possibilities in Memphis, that we make sure that our businesses are thriving, that our community is flourishing, that people are thriving, and that Memphis becomes a better place.